Hey, I want to I want to start off a little bit where I left off last week, and because uh, we're looking a little bit about this father and the son relationship, and and about relationships in general in the church, because one of the things you've got to understand is, um, I think a few weeks ago I said my dad had given me some good advice, and it wasn't so much about fighting, but it was about he said to me, "Son, it's not what you know in this life that gets you place; it's who you know." And I didn't really understand that fully until I met Jesus Christ. And once the Lord Jesus Christ came into my life, man, and, you know, I felt that mercy and forgiveness for all the sin and the rubbish of my life, and I felt his blessing and purpose and destiny started coming into my life, I realized that it's not what you know, it's who you know. And that knowledge of that personal knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, it's radical, it changes your life. Coming into the kingdom of God, you begin to discover that God has, and, I, and I'll say it this way, God is locked up pretty much all of his blessing, it's all accessible through relationship. And, um, and uh, in, in the church, people don't often really understand fully how critical and how important key relationships are within the church and spiritual relationship that we have with the Lord, how important it is because all of the inheritance and all of the blessing and all of the good things that God has in store for us is made available through our relationship with the Lord and through our relationship with each other. Um, I think it was John Alley talked about that scripture in Corinthians about communion. And he said, you know, that some of you have fallen asleep, some of you have died and this sort of thing, because you didn't rightly discern the body of Christ. And, um, and years ago, the Lord had spoken to me from that same scripture and said, you know, we, we haven't recognized what God has put in the body and we don't access the giftings and abilities on the lives of the people that are around us. Often we are operating independently and we're oblivious to what God has made available. Like even, even the solar thing, you might think it's a bit tacky, but the reality of it is, is, is I think that we could bless you by getting you something at a much better price than you could get anywhere else. And it's through relationship. It's, it's the relationship. But it's, it's much more than that. And uh, one of the things that's been on my heart more recently is, is the immaturity in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I, I you know, these things bother me because, um, you know, um, the Lord said, you know, let the children come to me. And the Lord also, the Bible also speaks of a childlike faith. But the scripture doesn't ever say that we should remain childish. We're not meant to be childish. We're meant to grow up into the full stature and the maturity of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and that, means, that means growing up and knowing, understanding how to maintain relationships and how to carry responsibility and how to be faithful and honest and have integrity. It's all about the image of Jesus Christ. Because we're not just meant to, you know, when we talk about following Jesus Christ, we're meant to follow his character, his attitude, his actions. Every, every part of his life, we... We're being transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ was not immature. Um, you know, he, it says, uh, it's kind of interesting because um, you remember when um, uh, they went to the temple, his family went to the temple and Jesus disappeared and they lost him for a few days and then he comes back. And um, um, I'll actually, I'll see if I can find, I wrote those scriptures down somewhere in my big pile of notes, but it's a really interesting little story because he goes away, and, um, and then he finally comes back to the family. Um, and uh, it's quite interesting what I said. Oh, man, I've got so many notes here for you. Man, you're just going to be inundated with all of this stuff. Luke 2.49, and he said to them, Why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? Here's this whole father, son, all of these relationships again. So he's about the father's business. But they did not understand the statement which he spoke to them. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth. And listen to this, because this, you might skip over this when you're reading it, and was subject to them. That's an interesting word because we don't really want to be subject to anybody. You know, our natural, our carnal and our natural nature is to be independent, not subject. <laughs> but this is Jesus we're talking about, and he's the example. So, the trouble is if we look at each other and take our example from each other, we're going to have a miserable form of Christianity. But when we go to the Word of God and we go to the life of Jesus Christ, 
then the, the standard just goes up and it's, it's quite exciting. He says, and he was subject to them, but his mother kept all these things in her heart. And then it says something very interesting. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. So when he came back and subjected himself to his parents, and, and that word might have a negative connotation to you, but he surrendered to their leadership, to their, their, their protection and blessing over his life. Then it says he grew, and he, and he grew in every area. He, he increased in his wisdom, his stature, which is physical, in favor with God and man. He, so what you actually see here, if Jesus didn't come back and subject himself to his parents, and honour his parents in that way, then the rest of that scripture probably wouldn't have been in there. <laughs> in fact, if Jesus was rebellious, had acted in a rebellious way, and, and had dishonoured and disrespected his parents, again, it would have screwed up salvation for humanity. It, it, you know, Some of these things are so important. Um, Jesus Christ never violated for a moment the will of God. And he never violated what we now see as the scripture, even though uh, he was physically born in the New Testament. There was 4,000 years of history before that, but he never violated the scripture. And um, he, he was a perfect man. He lived a perfect life and a mature life. So, so that's our example. It's like, um, <clears throat> so what I believe happens is if, if we don't understand the significance of relationship and submission to authorities, especially God as an authority, what it does is it stunts our spiritual growth. I tell you what, if you're religious and you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, that'll stunt your growth because re- there's no inheritance in religion. There's nothing to inheritance. It's just law and labor and hard works and trying to, uh, trying to please God and trying to please people. It, it's coming under the law. But when you come into a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, it's not about law. It, 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 it shifts and it's out of relationship that we grow and change. You know, we go from grace to grace, from glory to glory. Um, and we should go from maturity to maturity because in Ephesians 4, it says the goal is that we should reach the full stature and the maturity of Jesus Christ. In other words, we should just become like Jesus in every way. Now, what happens is when people get when they're independent, independence is religion. I, I, I actually, I probably haven't fully understood this um, myself really and looking at it, but I feel like the Lord's been talking to me about the spirit of independence. And, you know, independence is where sin entered the world. When they made an independent decision from the decision, the, the principles that God had laid out before Adam and Eve for their, the whole of humanity to be incredibly blessed and live in the presence of God. And they made an independent decision to go against what God had said to do what they wanted to do. I never fully realized how, uh, can I say it like that, how evil independence is. Independence, it cuts you off. It cuts you off from the presence of God. It cuts you off from each other. Um, You know, if a husband or a wife begins to act independently in the home, it cuts them off from, you know, their partner. Um, the trouble is like in New Zealand and that if we have esteemed independence said oh you know these independent go-getters you know they're out there doing their own thing and of course it's not that's not a godly concept and ind- independence actually is it's it, it robs you and one of the things I believe it'll rob you off in the body of Christ is maturity you you independent people it's like it's like when your kids are small and they're selfish or self-centered. They're self, you say, share, share, because you want the kids to learn how to share, because sharing is a part of growing up. It's a part of maturity. See, independence doesn't share. It's, it's, it's um, uh, who's that God? You know, I did it my way. <laughs> you know, um, I want to do it my way. I, c- I can go on without you. I don't care if you, I, I'm going to go on without you. I can walk with God alone. You know what I mean? I don't need to be in relationship. I don't need any man over me, any woman over me, anything like that over me. It's just me and God. Oh, is it now? You don't understand the scripture. And you're, actual, you're actually manifesting a spirit of independence and claiming it to be a godly attribute where you don't understand the scripture. You don't understand the scripture. We see God is raising up a holy people, a royal priesthood, but it's a holy community. And, and when, we, when we begin to function independently 
of the Spirit and of the revelation of God through the Scripture in the community, what it does is it stunts our growth. So you can get guys that are 40, 50 years old and they're just like little babies. I've, I've had, <laughs> I was going to say, it's funny, but I've actually had pastors stamping their angry little feet and screaming at me. And you go away and you're thinking, for goodness sake, man. You know what I mean? It's like, I know, I was, I was thinking about it, like I, I know you've, suffered rejection growing up as a kid. I know this happened in your life. I know people haven't been fair to you. I know you've had rough trials. I know you've had this. I know you have that. For goodness sake, deal with your issues because you're acting like a baby. And what we don't need to reproduce childish Christians. We don't need childish Christians. We need to come into the place of maturity in the things of God. And that's, that's dealing with your issues and facing your issues and the, and the biggest thing in facing your issues is taking personal responsibility. Tell you what, when I come to God in repentance, which is often, because you know me, you get to see my weaknesses. I'm up here with a microphone, so you know what I mean? You get to see who I am and who I'm not and what I can do and what I can't and my weaknesses and my strengths and all the bits and pieces. But often if I come to the Lord and repent, I start it with this, Lord, it's me. I did it. It's 100% my fault. You know, I'm responsible. I'm the one. Even if it's someone else has offended me, right, and I've been struggling with the resentment, I don't come and say, oh, then I did this. I go to him and I say, this, this is me. I'm not letting go. I haven't forgiven. Oh, you know, I'm the one. I'm the one. I actually was trying to think the other day of, Anyway, I won't go into that, but uh, um, I'm the one. So you start your repentance. It's always you start your repentance. I can't repent for you. You can't repent. For, it's always you start right there, and you come and you, and you lay yourself bare before the Lord, and you throw yourself on God's mercy, and God is merciful, and God is incredibly forgiving. He's incredibly loving. He's incredibly kind, and he just loves it. When we're learning the lessons and we come to him like that, I don't think he, he never rejects those prayers. He loves those prayers. You know, he picks you up and dusts you off and sets you back on the track again. God is such a good God. Anyway, I was going to start where I ended up last week and I'm off in a totally different vein. But anyway, it's a good vein. So in the book of Ruth, and I just want to, I want to focus on Ruth's prayer. And it's interesting because um, it possibly could have been called the book of Naomi, you know. Um, but it wasn't called the book of Naomi, although Naomi was the mother-in-law and, and she, she, was an, she was an awesome woman. But it's the book of Ruth because what the Lord wants us to understand is the attitude of Ruth. And, and, and it says this in 116, but Ruth said to Naomi, Naomi, entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you lodge, I will lodge. And your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. And where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. And the Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts you and me. That's why it's the book of Ruth, right there. Look at that attitude. This is like often the, the daughter-in-law, mother-in-law relationship is, you know, they can be a, a tense relationship sometimes. And, um, but here you see, and it's really interesting because I was thinking about Naomi and I was thinking about Naomi and, and I thought um, she wanted to change her name to Mara, which means bitter. So she was bitter. She was destitute, right? She was alone. She had no husband, had lost her sons. Um, she had no generational blessing. That, like her, the, her line had finished. Her husband had died. Her sons had died. There was no future for her. There was no line. There was no. That was that was her whole line was going to be uh, cut off right there. She had no daughters. She was poor. Um, they'd gone down to Moab because um, there was poverty in in Jerusalem and Bethlehem, and that they'd gone out of Israel down to Moab because there was poverty, was a shortage. But she had discovered that God was blessing Israel again and decided to go home. But when you think about, when you look at Naomi and the stuff around her life, you think, man, why were these daughter-in-laws following her? 
So there, there was something going on in God. I think, I, think it's, I think the whole key to Ruth's prayer is this, and your God will be my God. I think what happened is Ruth came under uh, Naomi and Naomi's son, and they were God-fearing, God-honoring people, and they found the God of Israel because the Moabites were, you know, different tribe. So they found the God, she found the God of Israel, and then all of the rest of that attitude. But so you, you think, oh, what, what, is, what does that matter? See, the reason that Naomi got so blessed and the reason that, um, uh, sorry, Ruth got so blessed and Naomi got so blessed was because of Ruth's heart attitude towards her mother-in-law. Now, if we go to Elijah and Elijah, 2 Kings 2, 6, and um, so Elisha is following Elijah. Elijah's the prophet. Elisha's following. All the way through in the Bible, Elisha is only ever Elijah's servant. He serves the man all those years. He's only ever the servant until he gets to the end. And then um, uh, Elijah's trying to push him away. And this is what Elisha says, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So the two of them walked on. <laughs> so this happens three times. Elijah says to Elisha, you know, I'm going to Jordan. I'm going here. I'm going here. And I want you to stay behind. And Elisha says the same thing. As surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I'm not going to leave you. So you see this relationship, this incredible relationship. Then it goes on. In chapter 2, verse 9, and it says, <clears throat> tell me what I can do for you before I'm taken from you. Because in the story, we know that Elijah's about to die. The Lord's about to take him. And so Elisha says, let me inherit a double portion of your spirit. And Elisha, Elijah, Elisha replied, and then and he said, um, Elijah said, you have asked a difficult thing. Yet if you see me when I'm taken from you, it will be yours. Otherwise, it will not. As they were walking along and talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. And Elisha saw and cried out, my father, my father. Kind of, have you recognized how all of these things connect? I'm going to show you a minute. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? <laughs> Someone else called that out thousands of years later, didn't they? My father, my father, the chariots and the horsemen of Israel, and Elijah saw him no more. Then he took hold of his garment and he tore it in two. So that was a sign of those days of great grief. Elisha just ripped his clothes in grief. They would, they would tear their clothes and sit in ash cloth and uh, sackcloth and ashes, and they would, they would grieve. And it shows the level of, of um, relationship that they had. Then Elisha picked up Elijah's cloak that had fallen from him and went back and stood by the bank of the Jordan. And then you know what happened. So when Elijah got taken up in the whirlwind, his cloak, his mantle had fallen down. And then Elisha picks up the mantle and he goes back to the Jordan River and he hits the river with the mantle and the waters part. And the double portion, miraculous life of Elisha begins. But what you can understand is all those prior years, all he ever was was a servant to Elijah. It's, really, it's a really interesting story. Have you noticed, and I think I pointed out a little while ago, how um, all of, just, about, just about every apostle that wrote a book in the Bible has started off with Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, J uh, Peter, a bondservant of Jesus, James, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, so-and-so, a bondservant of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ never asked any of those men to be a bondservant. That was their choice. And they described, they wanted everybody to know uh, when they wrote those books and wrote those letters to the church, they wanted everybody to know exactly what that relationship was like. I am a servant by my own choice to the will of God, to the Lord, to the Lord Jesus Christ, a bondservant of Jesus Christ. So what you've got to understand about this Father, son, mother, daughter, this, this relationship that is to go on within the body of Christ. It's not an obligation. It's an opportunity. See, it's not religion. It's not legalism. It's not you have to. See, what you, what you find in the Scripture, you don't have to do anything. 
God did give you free will. It's not, a, it's not an obligation, it's an opportunity. And, and what the opportunity is, like when we connect with the Lord Jesus Christ, like people can choose never to follow Jesus Christ or let him into their lives. They, they can choose that. That's, that's our freedom of choice. But what, when they choose that, they cut themselves off from every blessing, everything that God can provide. They just, they isolate themselves off. They go and live their own life, do their own thing. It's all got to be accomplished in their own strength. The whole lot of it, everything from that point on. But if you come and surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ, then you're allowing God's activity into your life. You come to the inheritance. So then when Paul and James and Peter and that says, I'm a bond servant of Jesus Christ, what they're saying is, I'm in a submissive relationship with the Lord. I'm here to do his will. Jesus said, I'm here to do the Father's will. And they said, I'm here to do the will of God. I'm here to do the will of Jesus Christ. So these relationships that we're talking about are not an obligation. They're an opportunity for you to access maturity and many, many, many of the blessings of God that are actually held for you in the relationships that you will have. Um, See, religion is a nasty thing. and, And I think the to some degree, the day of the denominational church is pretty much over because in the, in the Nazarene church that we came into the Nazarene church, they used to move the pastor about every two to three years. That was their goal because they never wanted the church to connect with their spiritual leader with the, as a father in the house because they wanted the people to be loyal to the denomination. But I want to tell you something. You don't get an inheritance from a denomination. You get, you get your inheritance from relationship. Your inheritance comes through your relationship with people, not from a, you can't actually have a relationship with a denomination. Like a denomination is an organization. Say that speaker there was an org, that's a denominational organization. You try to have a relationship with it. You can talk to it all day long. It's never going to answer you back. See, we, you can't have a relationship. I know a lot of guys, I do, I do you know, want to, act like the devil's uh, advocate, because I do think I have a relationship with my cars. <laughs> anyway, but <laughs> it is sad. It's sad for you girls that have got a relationship with a handbag that it's not going to take. Because <laughs> the difference is the car will take you somewhere. The handbag won't. You're going to be carrying that thing around for the rest of your life. Anyway, <clears throat> so... Relationship, relationship. you can't have a relationship with a denomination. You, the, the, the reason I have a bit of a crack at the TV preachers, and I'm a TV preacher, you can go and look at me on TV. Never wanted to be a TV preacher. But you know, you know why? Because all you can get if you have a TV relationship with me, all you can get is the teaching. You, you can't get the relationship. I'm more obnoxious in person than I am on TV. <laughs> And that, you miss out on all of that. You miss out on all of that part of my life. See? And see, what people do is they'll trade in a real relationship for a TV relationship. Why do, they, why do people do that? Because they're independent. Because, see, the, the TV preacher, there's people watching me now, right? And you know full well I'm speaking to you now. I'm never going to challenge you, not once about your spiritual life. I'm not going to step right up to your face and say, get your life sorted out, you mongrel. (laughs) I might do it over the TV. You know what I'm saying. That's why, you know, like, see, a lot of people after COVID and everything like that, they decided that they were just going to be TV Christians and they no longer want to attend church. And what they're they're actually doing without, without understanding, they're not understanding what they're doing, what they're actually doing is they're going independent. They're cutting themselves off. That guy, that guy, and you know, whether you're watching someone from India or Pakistan or America or Australia, he's never going to come and knock on your door. You're never going to bump into him in the, in the foyer of the church and have a conversation. Come on. The Holy Spirit's different because the Holy Spirit's here. You'll bump into him. If you love it, you'll bump into him all the time. I bump into him every morning. Sometimes it's good. <sighs> I have found in my relationship with the Holy Spirit, I've never had to correct him once. <laughs> He's just been incredible. He's incredible. I don't know, what can I say? He's just, anyway. 
Okay, let me, let me show you this, Deuteronomy 31, 7 and 8. Then Moses, Moses, what is it about all these guys are dying? You know what I mean? Do you have to die to pass on the word? But anyway, Moses, then Moses summoned Joshua and said to him in the presence of all of Israel, be strong and courageous for you must go with this people into the land the Lord swore to their ancestors to give them and you must divide it among them as their inheritance. And the Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. Listen to this. And he will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not. Like I put at the, at the top of, of my notes, till death do us part. Have you noticed how all of these spiritual relations that I talk about in the Bible are like marriages? Like they are, they are covenant type relationships. And, and, that's, and, and the relationship we have with Jesus, I want to tell you, you look up in the Bible, I found a hundred references in the scriptures to that concept, he will never leave you nor forsake you. The, the actual words themselves are repeated many times, but the inference in many, many scriptures is over and over and over and over again. Now, this is God. That was Moses speaking to Joshua and saying, God will never leave you nor forsake. This is God speaking to Joshua. Joshua 1, 5 and 6. As I was with Moses, so I'll be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and a good courage for this people you should divide as an inheritance, the land which I saw, swore to their fathers to give to them. No relationship, no inheritance. I give you everywhere your eye can see, everywhere your foot can tread. This is what the Lord said to Joshua. I give you all of that land and you divide it as an inheritance. Later on, way, way back, I think Caleb was he like 80 or something like that. He comes and he says, and it was at Caleb's daughter's. I don't know, Nancy will sort the story out for me when I get home. But uh, came and said, I can give me my inheritance. I think it was the daughter's. I want, I want the high land and the low land and all the land in between, something like that. But it was out of relationship. It was that, you see, all the inheritance came out of relationship. And, and that's what we've got to understand. Listen to, listen to this. This is Paul writing to the Hebrew church. For Jesus himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. David to Solomon, 1 Chronicles 28. And David said to his son, Solomon, be strong and of good courage and do it. Do not fear nor be dismayed for the Lord your God, my God, will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Jesus to us, Matthew 28, 20. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I am with you always. See, one of the, one of the things that it, it reveals the immaturity of the body of Christ is the inability to maintain relationship. And it, it's, not just, it's not just in the body of Christ, it's in the whole of society. People pack up on their marriages. Oh, we've outgrown each other. No, you haven't. You're babies. You don't outgrow each other. It's a lack of maturity. It's not that you've become too mature for your partner and you're not on the same wavelength. No, you're too immature to maintain the relationship and make, this, make it actually work. Now, I, I honestly, I admire, I don't know how people outside of the Lord Jesus Christ maintain a long-term marriage. And, and I certainly admire that because there's something in... And those people's character that enables them enables them to forgive and work through issues, and maybe sometimes they just bury those issues, and they just there's a whole lot of areas they never bring up. But I tell you what, I would much rather have the Lord Jesus Christ in my marriage because the Lord Jesus Christ, having Him in your marriage, at that at that's the key. You can come to a place of maturity where you can forgive, you can forget, you can move on, you can make allowances, you can accept your partner's strengths and their weaknesses. You, 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 can, you can love and embrace them and it's not determined by their performance. You're loving and embrace. The love of God comes in your heart and you embrace each other on that basis. And um, so it, it, the body has to mature and, and we have to mature. And the way that we come to maturity in Christ is our ability to maintain relationship and the ability to maintain relationship comes from maintaining an incredible relationship with the Lord and with the Holy Spirit. Um, uh, that, I think that's the, that's the key to everything. <clears throat> you know, um, there, was, there is a story, and let me see if I can um, 
Um, this, this is interesting because Hebrews chapter 2, this is Jesus. It's talking about Jesus again. <clears throat> it says, and this is uh, Hebrews 2.11, both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. And he says, I will declare God's name to my brothers and sisters in the assembly, and I will sing your praises, God. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, he says, here am I and the children God has given me. Now, what I want you to see here, I want you to see the diversity of relationship. You've got father, son, mother, daughter, uh, husband, wife, brother, sister. In the kingdom of God, what you've got to understand is God has no grandchildren. So everybody who comes to the Lord Jesus Christ is a son and a daughter of, of the Lord. So therefore, the, the primary relationship that we have in the body of Christ is that of brother and sister. We're all brothers and sisters in the Lord. There's no uncles, no aunties, no cousins. It's, we're all brothers and sisters in the Lord. And our, we all have the same heavenly father. We're all birthed and by the same Holy Spirit. And we're all brothers and sisters in the Lord. So where, where the diversity of relationship takes place is in the functional side of relationship. A mother and father has authority over the sons and daughters. It only makes sense. It's, it's a functional relationship. Um, you know, pastors and leaders of churches are given spiritual authority. It's, it's a functional, it's a functional. We're brothers and sisters, but in function, we're given different roles and different functions. But, but we've got to understand that the maintaining of quality relationship is still the key to the inheritance. See, the Lord says this, and I'll put it in my word, if you break a relationship here on brother-sister level, you've broken a relationship there on the father-son, the father-daughter level. If you don't forgive there, you don't get forgiven there. So if you don't think relationship is important in the body of Christ, you ain't even on baby steps yet. Because if you can't attain relationship there, if you let bitterness and resentment and disappointment, all the stuff come into your heart right down there, you can't re maintain relationship here. See, I meet people in the body of Christ all the time that have got allowed offence and different issues to come into their life down there, and they think they're doing awesome with God. You're not. You're deceived. You're deceiving yourself. Until you fix that, you're not, you're not really going anywhere here. So you'll get, you'll get, your maturity will get stunted. You, you get blocked in your walk. Um, you've, got, you've got to learn how to deal with the issues that are going to come down here. It says... It says um, Offence must come. Why? Because if you don't learn to deal with offence, hey, you're never going to mature. You're never going to go on in the kingdom of God. But what we see in the body of Christ and what we see out there in society is, is people are immature and they can't, they can't reconcile relationship. They can't maintain relationship. Um, this, this is an interesting one. And let me see if I can find the scripture. You'll know, you'll know the scripture if I... I can probably, um, this is in Luke 15, 19, and this is about the prodigal, isn't it? There's a, so there's a whole parable about what the prodigal son, and, um, and, it, and, the, and the prodigal said to himself that he would return to his father and say, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. Isn't that interesting? He had become independent, he demanded his inheritance from his father. His father, I don't know why, gave him the inheritance. He goes off, he squanders everything. He ends up living with the pigs. And he comes to the place where he has a realisation of the state that he's actually in. And I don't need to be holding this microphone any longer. <laughs> the state that he's actually in, look at that. A seamless, a seamless transition. It's like a security blanket. It looks like an ice cream, actually. That's what, anyway, but... Uh, so he says, he says this, he says, um, I'm no longer worthy to be called a son. He's already squandered the inheritance. This is interesting. He's already squandered the inheritance. Can I come back home as one of the hired help? Because he recognized that even the hired help in relationship with the household, with the father, had a much better life than he had who had become independent from the father. 
You see, you see, it's it's all about it's all about this community. It's all about a holy community. It's all about key relationships and holy community. See, in our natural lives, in that a lot of our relations, we get burnt all along the way. You know, we have all sorts of experiences, relational experiences. You know, there can be abuse, there can be misunderstanding. You might have gone through a divorce, or someone that you really loved and you thought was going to be, you know, your future going to be together. They betrayed you and. Then you come in the church, you get betrayed in the church. It's just happened, that's happened, that's happened. You, you, what happens is, is the enemy uses that to create a fear of intimacy and relationship in your life. Um, I woke up this morning and, and um, just I'd been praying about um, someone in the church that need, needs some ministry. And, and I was, I'd been praying about it and the, and the Lord spoke to me today. I woke up this morning. And um, the Lord spoke to me, and I just realized, I thought, that person, I don't think that person has ever come and sought help, come to the altar for prayer and that, yep, never come and actually opened up their lives, shared their lives, shared their struggle, and actually sought help. So even though they'd come back and forth to the altar, they had not got a breakthrough. And I'm thinking, see, there's a lot of people in the church, you don't get a breakthrough. And and because it's... <laughs> Because you often, when you get stuck in getting a spiritual breakthrough, it's not because God's not doing it for you. There's something wrong in the way you're approaching it. It, it says in James this. It says, it says in James, um, if anyone's sick, go to the elders of the church, right? And they anoint you with oil, lay hands on the sick, and the sick will recover. But when you go to the elders of the church with a sickness, you don't just go, what will happen? You don't just go, I'm sick, will you pray for me? That might happen at the altar call. What are you here for? I'm sick. All right, let's just lay hands on you and pray. No, when you go to the elders of the church, they'll say, well, what's wrong? Oh, I've got a wart on my bum. <laughs> it's a problem. I thought you were standing up with long periods of worship. I thought it was an act of adoration to the Lord, but now I realize you can't sit down. But you know what I mean? So what actually happens is you, you come into relationship and you you're interviewed when did it start have you sought medical help what what's been going on you know um we have nurses in the church that could surgically remove that for you you think oh i don't want anybody to see my rear end fair enough we don't want to see it either but what i'm trying to what i'm trying to say is that often the key to your breakthrough comes from humbling yourself and sharing your real problems it comes from actually being honest with somebody else other than yourself it actually comes from that saying i need help that's step one what's your pro this is what's happening around my life and that da, 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 da. so i think a lot of people that they don't get their victory because they're not see they're afraid like okay I, I analyze a lot of stuff. You wouldn't think I'm sanguine. I analyze lots of that thing. And I thought, and, and don't get me wrong with this. I thought, how come, and, and this, I'm not trying to make myself look good because you know I'm not that good, but I thought, how come I seem to love the church more than the church loves me? Like people can just walk away in the church. But you know, you know what? I analyze that. And you know why it is? Because I'm up here sharing my life with you every week. And you know what that is? It's intimacy. You know what that is? Into me see. You're not, you're not overwhelmed or deceived about who I am. You know who I am because you see me up there all the time. You hear my heart. Maybe sometimes you'll misunderstand it. You know my frailties. You know when I start trying to pronounce Bible words that I'm useless, I can't do it. You know what I mean? I struggle with it. Um, but I can add, don't worry about that. <laughs> but you know what? The reason is because when you're in ministry, whether you're a soul group leader, you're a worship leader, or if there's any form of communication going on in a ministry relationship, you're letting people into your life. But in this formal sort of a setting, I'm not getting into your life. Not, not through a relationship I'm not. I am through the Holy Ghost. Like I could read your mail. You know, I don't do that very often. But it's not that I'm not aware of what's going on in your life. I'm, I'm aware, I'm aware of what's going on. If I wanted to, I could go along and tell you a whole lot of stuff about you. But anyway, it's a waste of time. But um, well, you might want to. Do you want a, pro a prophecy? Eh? Or, anyway, but 
the moment I get with you and we're sitting down and having a coffee and you begin to talk about your life, the relationship changes. I, I want to tell you something about this area of relationship, fathers and sons, mothers and daughters. I want you to understand something very clearly. It's all about the heart. What did God say about David? I found a man after my own heart. See? And it's all about, it's all about letting people into your life and, and, and it's, it's about giving your life. It's about, it's, a, it's about allowing access. It's about allowing people to have access into your life. See, when we get beaten up and hurt and misunderstood and all that sort of stuff, we close off. We put walls up and uh, we put obstacles up. It's called, they, they, I, love, I call them fortresses because they're in our mind. We put all these barriers up in our mind to keep people out because we don't want to get hurt again. But the reality of it is your healing, your healing is in being vulnerable and being open and allowing people into your life. That's where your healing's at. So as long as you keep them out, you don't get healed. You, you just go from one battle to the next battle, from one problem to the next problem. You go from one painful relationship to the next painful relationship, from one disappointment to the next disappointment. And, and, and that's what happened. You go on and on and on from disappointment to disappointment. And what's actually being built up in your life is I've got to protect myself. I've got to protect myself. I've got to protect myself. I've got to keep the boundaries up. I can't let people in. I can't let people in. I can't let people know what's really going on in my life. I can't let them in. Because if I let them in, I'm going to get hurt. But see, you, you, you're also, see, you've got to come to the place, you've got to come to the place where you let people in, whether you get hurt or not. See, the, the maturity is dealing with the hurt. It's not, you're never going to get a situation in a church, anywhere, in any nation, where there's not the potential for you to be disappointed, discouraged, and hurt. So, what's the answer to it? It's not trying to find the perfect church. Because as soon as you get there, it's no longer perfect. You know what I mean? It was going great until you came along. Then you joined the church. And oh, my God, you know, everything just turned to custard at that point. It's not about that. It's not about finding the perfect place. It's not about always moving on. I need another relationship. I'm sick of this husband, this wife. Let's get another one, you know, and, you know, go for it. It's not about, it's not about that. It's, it's about opening your heart again. Loving you, loving again, and learning how to deal with the pain and the hurt and the disappointments that come your way. That's what mature people do. They deal with their stuff. They deal with it. So I, I'm quite, uh, no, I hate it when people say, oh, I'm concerned, but I'm concerned. I just sort of, I want the church to grow up. I want you to grow up. I want you to, I want you to experience what it is to have a mature life in the Lord Jesus Christ, to be able to roll with the punches, deal with the pain, bounce back, love again, love again, love again, love again, love again, love again, just get up, get up, get up. They said, how many times, Lord, do we have to forgive? Seven times? No, 70 times seven. Get up, just get up. Oh, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, you're probably going to get hurt again, but just get up and get on with it and love again and love again and love again. See, what happens is, I tell you what, there's a lot more people leave churches than pastors leaving. And the reason for that is, <coughs> the, the reason for that is, let's hope this is the reason. The reason for that is that spiritual leadership, they have to come to a place of maturity pretty quickly, otherwise you'll die in the ministry. You'll get so beaten up in the ministry dealing with people you know what I mean? It, it doesn't take too long um, for people in ministry and people in leadership to get beaten up in the ministry. If you can survive that, if you can survive 35 years, that, yeah, they'll sing that song at your funeral. <laughs> I will survive. <laughs> I did survive. Hey, hey. When people are immature and they can't deal with the issues, they cash in and they leave. They move on. Now, I'm not saying that so everybody here stays in the church. You can do whatever you want to do. It's not my church. Don't you realize that? It's not my church. Um, it's God's church. But if you want to grow up into maturity, there comes a point where you've got to put some stakes down and say, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to deal with these issues. 
The reason these stories about Elisha and Ruth are in the Bible because they hold up as this most incredible example for us in, in how to walk in maturity and in a heart relationship with the Lord and with the body of Christ. Um, you know, one of the things that's going to be a great challenge in the body of Christ is for churches to love one another and to begin to come together. And it, it, it's an, I've been, I mean, I've been working at doing some of that and reaching out, and I want to tell you, it's a mission. And if it's a mission for leaders of churches to come together in relationship, how much more should it be a mission within a local church? But... Um, Somebody's got to begin somewhere. Someone's got to bite the bullet and say, right. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. We're not going to follow the principles of the world. We're not going to take offence. Because I know, look, you can, come to a, you can come to a point in your spiritual life where you're no longer offended. Not that, it's not that offensive things don't happen to you. You don't take it. You say, no, 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 I'm not having that. What's the use? What does offence do for you? other than isolate you and make you independent. Am I too pragmatic? I just think it's a waste of time. It's a waste of time me getting mad at all, you know, and all bitter and twisted about you. What a waste of my life. I am so selfish, I'm not prepared to waste my life by being bitter and twisted about your life. I'm not sure if that's independence or godly. It might be a godly. John 7, 16, this is Jesus speaking, and this is what he said, and this is what you need to understand and we need to understand. My teaching is not my own. It comes from the one who sent me. Anyone who chooses to do the will of God will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. Whoever speaks on their own does so to gain personal glory. But he who, who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is a man of truth, and there is nothing false about him. And, I, and the, the reality of it is anybody who gets into form of spiritual leadership, we're here to teach the scripture and the ways of Jesus Christ. We, it's, this message is not my message. If I start challenging independence, I'm not attacking independent people in the church. I'm trying to bring you a message from the scripture, from the Lord, that will revolutionize your life. Once you get the walls down and connect, it'll revolutionise your life. It'll give you access to things that you never experienced before or never imagined. You know, when you meet someone, you might be young, you might be older, you meet someone, you fall in love and you just think, oh, this is so incredible. You know, this is incredible. It, it, it can wear off. <laughs> but <laughs> quality relationships gives you that potential to experience that blessing that comes from a key relationship in your life it's it's yeah see the the person the human on the earth that blesses me the most is nancy and the reason is because of the intimacy and the life that we've shared together i mean we've been together over 50 years so the person who has the most influence, the most power, the most impact, is the most blessing, that's Nancy right there. And why? Why? Why isn't it some spiritual giant in ministry somewhere? Because of the level of relationship. The, the, the inheritance is in, the blessing is in the relationship. It's not that we haven't had battles and struggles along the way. I mean, the Lord's had to do some amazing things in Nancy's life. <laughs> I have a disturbed sense of humour. Get over it, you know. But, see, that's, that's where, that's where the, if, you, if you get in there in a marriage and you commit and you covenant and you deal with your issues, you will find that's the richest relationship. That person knows more about you often than you know about yourself. You ask your wife. She knows more about you than you know about yourself. It's scary. In fact, I suggest you don't ask her. <laughs> okay, I'm closing up now with this, and this will be a miracle if I can accomplish closing. Um, let, me, let me just push, push the relationship over to another place. Hebrews 13, 7 says, Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you, Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Isn't that interesting? Imitate their faith. 
their faith, what they, what they believe, but consider, consider them. It clarifies a little bit more in, in Hebrews in 13, 17, and, and, and you won't like this because it says, obey your leaders and submit to their authority. They keep watch over you as men who must give an account. Obey them so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no advantage to you. You, you get that? So if it's, I know that you know, as soon as you say obey a leader, you know, the heckles will go up. But that's why I read out my teaching is not my own. <laughs> this is Bible stuff. This is Bible stuff now. So if you're going to be a Christian, you've got to do the Bible stuff. Um, 1 Thessalonians 5.12. Now we ask you, brothers, to respect those who work hard among you, who are over you in the Lord and who admonish you. Hold them in harsh regard and love because of their work. Um, in, Galatians, in Galatians, it talks about, it gives an analogy between the slave woman and the free woman. And the slave woman represents those people who are under the law or in religion. And the free woman represents those people who are in relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, which is not religion. It's, it's the opposite to religion. And it says, the slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance with the free woman's son. In other words, in religion, and uh, when, you're, when you're in religion and when you're under the law, you don't receive the inheritance. In that story of Ruth, <clears throat> the two daughter-in-laws, um, uh, Naomi's, Naomi's two daughter-in-laws, uh, Ruth and Ophar, Ruth clings to Naomi, and then you read about all the blessings. She ends up in the line of Jesus Christ. She ends up in the lineage of Christ. It's, it's, Ruth is a Moabite, and she ends up in the line. Ophar goes back to her people and to her God, and the Bible, she's never mentioned again. She just never, she doesn't exist. It, it, it just doesn't exist. It's probably somewhere, something in history, somebody knows something about it, but it just gets wiped out. And so it's not an obligation to come into a quality relationship it's an opportunity for you to access what God has for you. It's, it's a great opportunity to access. Um, that's why, like I, and I don't mean it as I work hard, but um, with the relationships I have with ministry and that, I, I, I make a commitment to those relationships. Like, you know, I, there's guys, there's ministers in the nation of New Zealand and overseas that there's ministers in New Zealand I ring pretty much every single week. And then there's guys overseas I, I ring and call in contact with on a less regular basis. But they're key, they're key ministry relationships in my life. And so for those relationships to stay healthy and strong and for them to benefit each other, we have to maintain them. See, you have to maintain those relationships. And, um, you know, if you're feeling a bit irky about it, that you've got you to talk about the stuff and maintain the relationship. Otherwise, the blessing stops. I, um, uh, I am finishing, the musicians can come, but the, and I closed that down. And um, one of the other studies I was doing this week was, um, it's an interesting one, it's between um, Jacob and Esau. Is it Jacob and Esau, Nance? Isaac was the father, Jacob and Esau. Um, it's really, really interesting because um, uh, in that story, there's a cool thing that actually happened. I think Rachel was the mother. And um, when the kids are born, they're twins, but before they're born, the twins are fighting inside of her and she's feeling this contention. And uh, it's really interesting because Rachel was actually barren and Isaac, her husband, sought the Lord that God would bless her with children and God answered his prayer. So Isaac was a godly man. That's a great part of the story. And then now, they, now she's got twins and they're fighting within, within her, and she seeks the Lord to know what's going on. And the Lord says to her, you have two nations inside of you, and the younger, the older will serve the younger, right? That's, that's, so, so Rachel gets the word of the Lord concerning the two boys, and the word of the Lord is the older is going to serve the younger. So when you get further down in the story, and the mother's saying to Jacob, you know, put the goat's thing on your thing and deceive the father to get the inheritance, the blessing. It's because she had the word of the Lord. Jacob had to get the blessing. That was God's will. It was God's will for Jacob to get the blessing. It was God. The blessing should have gone to the oldest son. 
but it was God's will that the younger son was going to get the blessing in these circumstances. So it looks like manipulation, but she's orchestrating things around so the will of God is ultimately done. Because Esau, we know why. It says God hated him. That's a scary thought. God hated Esau. Why did he hate Esau? Because he despised his birthright, his inheritance. He sold it. He sold his inheritance. And, um, and, and, and he despised it. So anyway, um, uh, then what, what you see, what actually, what you see uh, happen is God blesses Jacob with Esau's blessing. Esau starts crying out, oh, father, oh, father, you know, you blessed the wrong one. Isn't there a blessing for me also? And the father says, it's amazing. In scripture, he says this, he says, I've given him everything. That's what he says. I'm paraphrasing. He says, I gave him the blessing and I have given him everything. And he says it almost, I'm not sure if there's anything left for you. And you know, and then he, then he musters up faith and gives, he does give a blessing to Esau. It's a, it's a minimalistic blessing he gets. And then you know what he does? Then he blesses Jacob a second time. That, that would make Esau feel happy. No wonder Esau wanted to kill him. <laughs> so, I'm, uh, what I, you could lose the blessing is the point of that. You could lose, if you despise the inheritance, if you don't understand the scripture, if you don't understand um, uh, the word that, um, uh, the word is the, uh, the prerequisite for the blessing, there's, there's, you know, you do something to get the blessing. And if you don't do the something, you don't get the blessing. If you despise the inheritance of the house, if you're despising the leader, you're despising your parents, you're despising the inheritance, you ain't getting it. You can come to church every week. You'll never receive what's in the house. You, you understand what I mean? You can remove yourself away from the blessing of the house. You can get to the place where, the, oh, the teaching's useless. I'm not getting anything out of the teaching. Because you're not, you don't understand. There's, there's things that you have to fulfill to receive the word. And, and part of that is honouring. Honour your father and mother. Part of that, if you honour, you will receive. If you dishonour, criticise, negative, you won't receive. And then you know what you'll do? You'll, you'll blame them. Oh, you know, they're useless. No, you're useless. <laughs> oh, I've been going along there and there's nothing new. No, you can't hear. <laughs> You're deaf. Why? Because you're dishonouring. You're critical. You're negative. You've shut yourself off. Oh, I'll go over here and, you know, that's much better. No, see, yeah. I give up. No, I don't. So, <clears throat> till death do us part. It goes right back. It goes right back to the, the whole covenant relationship. And, and God said in the marriage, what man is... Join together, let no man put asunder. So the key thing for you is, as, and us together is, is finding that connection in the Lord and joining, joining together. And when you join, you join, you join. And you don't remain in relationship with old girlfriends and old boyfriends and all your past, all that. Right? That, all get, that goes. Chop that off. If you want to bring them into your marriage, you it's going to be miserable. It's not going to go well with you. It's the same. So you, God, look, I believe God brings people to the house of the Lord, to, to where he wants them to be. And you'll feel that in your heart. You might say, I came in here, I just felt like I was home, or the presence of God, or I sat in the church, I just started crying and crying. What is all of that? that God's trying to witness to your heart. He's trying to get you to put roots down and become a part of something that he's going to do. And oh, I just think this is so important. So anyway... I know this morning that there's uh, visitors here and people that have come and maybe you've never really had a supernatural encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. And, uh, you know, you might, you might not even know that God's real. You know, that's how I was when I first went to church the first time. And um, the pastor said to me, which I think was something that really helped me, he said, if you don't believe God is real, why don't you ask God to prove himself to you? And right back in 1975, that's what I did. I said, God, I was in the service, I said, God, if you're really real, if there is a God, and if you're real, I want to know you. Why would I not want to know you? 
If you created the heavens and the earth and this whole spiritual thing is real and there really is a God, why wouldn't I want to know you? I want to know you. And um, it was just a few weeks after that that I had a supernatural encounter with the Lord. My encounter just happened to come about in the middle of an LSD trip, but God just changed me. Things just changed. And what, I, what I've experienced in the Lord ever since, God's been changing me ever since. And next week I'll be better than this week because he will have changed me again, you know, because that's what the Lord does. But if you're here this morning, you're, you're not here by chance. You're here because God brought you here and God wants to encounter you and encounter your life. And uh, God wants to have a relationship with you and he wants you to have a relationship with him. And uh, he wants there to be uh, intimacy. And, you know, the world screws that word up. But what he wants, he wants you to know his heart and he, he, want, he will know your heart, but he wants you to know his heart and have a relationship with him. So we're going we're gonna to sing and I'm going to give you an invitation. We can stand. If you want to come and commit yourself to the Lord and get to know God, then what we do, we invite people to come forward. We just pray for you. We don't embarrass anybody. We just pray for you. 